Right, so my goal right now is just to try to derive the equations of motion for the three body problem, maybe using multiple way. I guess the first thing is, do we understand the one body problem? Yes, the one body problem is pretty easy. Nothing's going on. Okay, two body problem. Do we understand the two body problem? I think the answer is yes. All right, if you've got two bodies, I'll call the bigger one M1 and the smaller one M2. So M1 is greater than M2 in general. So if these are just out in free space, there's going to be some center of mass between them. And the center of mass will be on the line connecting the two. So we'll have vector R2 and vector R1. They will be related in a certain way. If you remember from Newtonian mechanics, right, you've got two bodies out in space. These two may be orbiting each other, but just the fact that we have two masses out in space means that the center of mass is going to be moving on a straight line with constant velocity in the absence of any other bodies, which means that we could choose that center of mass to be the origin for our inertial frame. So instead of calling it C, I'll actually call it O and say that this is the origin for our inertial frame. And I like to use subscript N for, you know, well, N3 is coming out of the, out of the screen at you. This is an inertial frame. It's a frame where we could use Newtonian mechanics. It's got its origin at the center of mass or Berry center. It's at the center of mass of the M1, M2 system, independent of what M1 and M2 are doing. So we're further going to restrict ourselves this circular in the circular restricted three body problem, it assumes that the two massive bodies are on a circular orbit about one another. So M1 and M2 are assumed to be on a circular orbit about their common center of mass. That helps us. We know some things given that. We know that based on Kepler's law, if we say the distance between these two is the semi-major axis A, then Kepler's law states that the angular speed, which I'll call N, the angular speed squared is going to equal G, the gravitational constant, times N1 plus M2 over A cubed. N is the orbital rate, let's say radians per second. If you like thinking of things in terms of the period of the motion, then the period is two pi over n. So we know the rate at which they're, they're rotating around. We also know how M1 and M2 are related due to something called the center of mass corollary. M1 times R1 plus M2 times R2 if we were to say divide that by the total mass, that would be the location of the center of mass for these two bodies. But the location of the center of mass in the frame that we chose is the origin. So it just equals the zero vector. So we can get rid of this and we have that. So any of you who've taken my class, you know that I call this the center of mass corollary. It's basically saying, where is the location of the center of mass in the center of mass centered frame? And it's the origin. So this tells us we can rewrite this to be R2 is negative M1 over M2 times R1. So all we really need to solve for is the motion of R1 or R2, and we get the other one for free. So the two body problem really reduces down to a one body problem. And that's what makes it very nice. We also know that the distance between these two, because we're assuming it's a circular orbit and the center of mass is A, that the magnitude of R1 plus the magnitude of R2 is A. Maybe I'll put that here. So magnitude of R1 plus magnitude of R2 equals A. We can use that along with the center of mass corollary to figure some things out, such as we can combine to get that R1 times 
M1 plus M2 over M2 equals A, which we could write another way as R1 equals M2 over M1 plus M2 times A. So the distance of each mass, and these masses are called the primaries in the language of the three-body problem. And sometimes the massive one is called just the primary, and the less massive one is called the secondary. So I might use that language. The distances are related by this ratio. So this ratio is going to become very important. This is what most books will call the mass parameter or mu or the reduced mass. So this is the mass of the secondary divided by the total mass. And it is the main parameter of the three body problem. It plays the role analogous to Reynolds number for fluid flows and that you could have different phenomena depending on what the Reynolds number is. You could have different phenomena in the three body problem depending on what this mass parameter is. And in the solar system, the mass parameter tends to be pretty small. So the mass parameter for the sun earth system, this is, I'm just giving approximate values. It's about uh, three times 10 to the negative six. So that means the earth divided by earth plus sun is about 10 to the negative six. In the earth moon system, it's closer to 10 to the negative two. The largest planet, Jupiter, this gives us a mass parameter of about 10 to the negative three. You know, smaller planets like Mars be uh, 10 to the negative seven. There's different phenomena that can occur, like I said, and also the sort of speeds of what we're calling low energy trajectories depend a lot on this mass parameter. The largest the mass parameter could be is um, usually we consider M2 to be smaller. So we're assuming mu is less than 0.5 and greater than zero. I guess another thing to notice is you'll see that I put M2, the secondary, on the right-hand side. Eventually, I'm going to look at a rotating frame where we'll, we'll look at the line along the primaries as one of our directions. And I'll have the direction pointing to M2 as one of the directions. For now, we have that. I think I need to make another sketch. Secondary, the primary, N1, N2. We should give some coordinates. So I'm going to say this coordinate axis, this coordinate axis. I'll use capital X for anything measured along the N1 direction and then capital Y for anything measured along that N2 direction and then capital Z for the other. So if we have a point mass or test particle or spacecraft, it doesn't affect these two, but does feel their effect, then we need to take into account the gravity. That's the only effect that's present. So the gravity due to mass two, the gravity due to mass equal one. And then we could start putting this into Newton's laws. Let me write this again as this vector is R1. This vector is R2. And then this vector that says where the point P is, I'll call that little r. The location of the point P from M1, we'll call little r1. And the location point P from uh, M2, we'll call little r2. R, I'll write this in a column vector format. The location of the particles given by X, Y, and capital Z. The location of big R1, so that's where it is with respect to the origin. I'll use, um, we'll call this X1 and Y1, and then zero. And then same for two x2, y2, and zero. And we know what x1, y1, x2, and y2 are. I guess I should say I've chosen the x, y plane to be the plane in which the two primaries are orbiting each other. So we want to know first little r1 will be little r minus big r1. 
and little r2 will be little r minus big R2. This is x minus x1, y minus y1, and then this will just be z. And this will be x minus x2, y minus y2, and z. Because it'll show up, we need to find out what is R1, just the magnitude. R1 squared is just, just based on this, you know, big x minus big x1 squared plus big y minus big y1 squared plus z squared. Same for r2. Big x minus big x2 squared plus big y minus big y2 squared plus z squared. Now what about Newton's laws? All right. For the mass, the particle, the spacecraft, we could say that it has a mass m. It won't end up mattering because it'll cancel out both sides of the equation. But if we do write Newton's second law, we'll have the mass of the spacecraft times its acceleration. And I'll just abbreviate that this way, vector r with a double dot. So this is the acceleration with respect to this inertial frame. So that's m times acceleration equals f1 plus F2, the two forces that are present. And let's just jump to what those are. We use Newton's law of gravitation. So this will be negative G M1 times M over R1 squared, right? The force is one over R squared. And it's directed, the negative here is because this is directed in the R1 hat direction. That's the unit vector in the direction of R1. So that's the force F1. Force F2 is the same thing, but with the secondary. So G times mass M2 times M for R2 squared R2 hat. So there we go, um, where hopefully it's clear. What, what is you know, RI? RI is RI, the vector divided by the magnitude. We look at this and we'll see that the mass of the spacecraft isn't going to play any role. So we'll just cancel it out once and for all. And then we could look at this component by component. Let's just look at the first component. So it'll be capital X, double dot, equals negative G M1 over R1 squared. And then what do we get for that component? It'll be capital X minus capital X1 divided by R1. So we'll just absorb the R1 over in the other terms. We have actually R1 cubed. Second term is for what the secondary gives us. And it follows a very similar pattern. This is going to be X minus X2. And uh, for now, let's just say, et cetera, for y double dot and z double dot. Because we need to say a few things here about, well, what is x1 and x2? We'll use the fact that the two primaries are on a circular orbit to write out their position as a function of time. So really, x1 is just a known quantity. We've got x1, y1, and z1. What is this going to be? negative that mass parameter mu times the semi-major axis a that's the distance between the two primaries times cosine n t remember n is the rate of the orbit it's the orbital rate so this is assuming that at time t equals zero m1 is along the negative x axis for y1 this will be mu a sine n t and this is all happening in the xy plane, so that's zero. We'll have something similar for x2. Instead of mu, it's one minus mu. So one minus mu is, um, hold on here, this is a big one minus mu a cosine nt, one minus mu a sine nt, and then zero, right? Because about the center of mass, this angle is n times t in terms of radians. 
So that's what's going on here. This is M2, this is M1. This distance is mu times A. This distance is one minus mu times A. So we know the positions of each of those. They're periodic in time. If we plug this in to our X equation, so let's just look again at this and now plug in what we have. We want to non-dimensionalize if we can. So this is a standard approach if you've taken certain engineering courses and almost all physics courses is that you want to non-dimensionalize. That's where the Reynolds number came from is you non-dimensionalize the governing equation, which in that case is the Navier-Stokes equation here. We want to non-dimensionalize this equation. It's one up here from Newton's law. And this is just one of them. This is the first component out of three. Have any of you heard of a standard way to non-dimensionalize? So I, I have another video that's about the Buckingham Pi theorem. Because I was excited when I learned about this because I didn't know until I was well into my 30s that there was any kind of systematic way to non-dimensionalize. I thought it was all a bunch of guesswork. And then I learned about this thing that had been known for a long time, but I was ignorant of it. So the Buckingham Pi theorem, this is pretty cool. So this is just... You know, how do you non-dimensionalize? Non-dimensionalizing the governing equation. So there are some guides. You first look at your equation and you look at all of the variables. So you count how many variables are in your equation. In this case, we can figure that out. How many variables? And I'll just start listing them. So we've got, we've got X. We've got, we've got Y, we've got Z, right? These are variables that describe the location of the particle. We've got the time, T. It's, it's in there explicitly in terms of where the primaries are. It's also there in the time derivative. When we take two time derivatives, we're taking derivative with respect to T. So we have at least four variables. What else? Uh, I see a G. That's the gravitational parameter. Uh, we've got M1. We've got M2. We already got rid of just M, so that, that doesn't show up anywhere. We have, in terms of how the two primaries are moving, we have N. We also have the distance between the two primaries. That's A. Dr. Ross, is G a constant, or we count it as a variable in this situation? So we consider it as a variable in this situation, even though, yeah, it's like constant throughout. Yeah, we, right now we're calling it a variable because it's like a symbol that shows up. In some sense, we jumped the gun in writing mu, but mu is just based on M1 and M2. If we hadn't done that, we'd still be writing M1 and M2 everywhere. So we say, how many variables? And the answer is nine. And that becomes, okay, we'll say K equals nine. All right. Now the thing you do is you look at what the dimensions are and you look at how many dimensions are required to describe all of these variables. The trick that I use is I'll do this thing where I write, I'll put a bracket around something and that means what are the units? So the units of X, um, you could say it's distance, but more fundamentally it's length. So common ones are length, time, and mass. What's the dimension of X? It's L. What's the dimension of Y? It's L. So it's a length. What are the dimensions of Z? Length. What are the dimensions of time? Ooh, that's a new one. So that's, I'll use capital T for time. What are the dimensions of A? Again, length. Okay, so we have at least two types that are being used, at least for that top row. Uh, G, that's an interesting one. I don't know if you've looked at G recently but it's length cubed over mass times time squared. Okay, so now all the units come in with G. What are the units of M1? It's M, a mass. What are the units of M2? It's a mass. What are the units of N? Well, it's radians per second. Radians are considered unitless. So this is just one over T. How many dimensions required to describe them? Well, we've got L, which is length, M, which is mass, and then T, 
which is time. So we call this number R, and this is three. So it takes three dimensions to describe our nine variables, which means according to something called the Buckingham Pi theorem, K minus R equals six non-dimensional numbers are needed to describe the system. And when I say numbers, this means new variables. So we'll come up with new variables that describe the system, meaning we don't need nine. We're going to need six. Now you can do the guesswork and stuff, but at least now we have an idea that if we end with six, we're on the right track. So I'm going to show you what's one obvious thing that we could do. We could write X, Y, and Z, capital X, Y, and Z, in units of A. A is that given distance between the primaries. So that's what we'll do. We'll choose the unit of length to be A. That means we'll define some new variables. Instead of X, I'll call it chi. So chi is going to be capital X divided by A. Eta will be Y divided by A. And then I have the hardest time in the world writing Zeta. I, I think it looks like that divided by A. If you write everything in terms of A, maybe some kind of magic will happen. So if we go back and write X double dot, I'll just rewrite it for us. X double dot equals, before we do that, I'm gonna write every time I have M1, I'm gonna write it as one minus mu times the sum, M1 plus M2. And M2 will just be mu times M1 plus M2. That's true. This is why I'm doing this. I'm able to pull out an overall G times M1 plus M2. And then I've got negative one minus mu, right? That was the M1 thing times C times A plus mu A cosine NT divided by R1 cubed. So that's the term that corresponds to the gravity effect in the x direction of the mass m1. I think maybe I'm missing another parenthesis. The second one will be mu times c a minus one minus mu a cosine nt divided by r2 cubed. Now we could write, instead of using r1, we could use row one. So I'm going to say R1 is A times a non-dimensional row one. Row one squared would be C minus mu cosine NT squared plus eta plus mu sine NT squared plus zeta squared. And Similarly, R2 equals A row two. Up here, let me just erase these and change it into A cubed row one cubed. Same thing for this, A cubed row three cubed. I'm trying to non-dimensionalize. That's why I've pulled these things out. You'll notice up above, right, we've got A, 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 A. So we could pull out an overall A, so that means this becomes X double dot equals G M1 plus M2 over A squared times this thing, one minus mu C plus mu cosine NT over row one cubed minus mu C minus one minus mu cosine NT row two cubed. We're getting close to non-dimensionalizing it, but we're not there yet. We haven't done anything with capital X double dot. How can we write capital X double dot? Well, we said, let's just use this. So using that, we should be able to write this as A times C double dot. Pull that A over to the other side, 
got a cubed. What is C double dot? C double dot means this is two derivatives of C with respect to the usual time in seconds. But maybe, maybe we need to use a different unit of time. And the unit of time that sort of, uh, it, it, it should jump out to you is this thing nt, n times t. We should probably use that as a non-dimensional unit of time. So we're gonna use tau, which equals n times t as the non-dimensional unit of time. I mean, all of this hopefully makes physical sense. What is the natural length scale here? It's the distance between the two primaries. What is the natural time scale? It's the period of the two primaries. So this n is related to the period, so it makes sense to use that. So if we wanted to write dc dt, you could write this as dc d tau, the non-dimensional time, times d tau dt. And what is d tau dt? d tau dt from this equation up here is just n. So this becomes n. You take another derivative, d tau squared, and you just end up getting another factor of n. So this is n squared times two derivatives of c with respect to tau. And maybe just for convenience, I'll say derivative with respect to the non-dimensional time will use a prime. So this is c double prime. So this was c double dot and it's n squared c double prime. So let's just substitute that in here. We have n squared c double prime. And everywhere we had nt, we could write now tau, tau, tau. Move the n squared over, n squared. So we've got this factor out in front. Anyone know what that factor is? I mean, we could call this a non-dimensional number. It's, it's unitless. Let's call it gamma. But, you know, gamma is something special. G M1 plus M2 N squared over A cubed. This is actually just a way of writing one. Kepler's law. Kepler's law told us that N squared equals G M1 plus M2 over A cubed. That's cool. Almost miraculous. So in some sense, gamma is one of our non-dimensional numbers, and it just happens to be one. So gamma, the non-dimensional number. We could do this for all of the components. So this was the X component. We could do something similar for Y and Z. So our non-dimensionalized second order ODEs are this. So C double dot is negative one minus mu. So the thing related to Kepler's law just sort of drops it out. And then we, what do we have? C plus mu cosine tau divided by rho one cubed minus mu C minus one minus mu cosine tau divided by rho two cubed. Eta, it's gonna look very similar. Just now we have eta and this, this will be plus mu sine tau rho one cubed minus mu eta minus one minus mu sine tau rho two cubed. Zeta is the easiest. So this will just be negative one minus mu zeta over rho one cubed minus mu zeta rho two cubed. So these are non-dimensionalized ODEs describing the motion of the particle in the field of the two bodies using an inertial frame. And let's just see if the Buckingham Pi theorem gave us something. So we've got C is non-dimensional, eta, uh, zeta, and tau. So that's four. We have gamma, which just happened to be one. That was a fifth one. And then mu. These are our six non-dimensional variables that the Buckingham Pi theorem told us should happen. One of them is just one, so it's like, who cares? Three are position, one is the non-dimensional time, and then mu is really the main parameter that describes the type of motion that's possible. So this is analogous to the Reynolds number. 
except it has bounds, whereas Reynolds number can go close to zero as you want and as unbounded as you want. This goes between 0.5 and as small as you want, but it plays a similar role. So we've non-dimensionalized. We've hopefully set up the problem. What we're going to do next time is look at the motion in a rotating frame. It's okay if you wanted to view how M1 and M2 and your particle P are all moving around with respect to some inertial frame. But the equations are explicitly time dependent with these. And it would be great to get rid of that time dependence. It will actually simplify things in ways that you'll only understand later to get rid of the time dependence. And we get rid of that time dependence if we jump into the co-orbiting frame. So next time we'll talk about going into a frame, I'll, maybe I'll call it the B frame. So it's the frame that's co-orbiting with the two bodies. B1 is always pointing towards M2 and B2 is perpendicular to it. And then B3 is out of the screen. It's the, the axis of rotation. If we view the motion in this frame, we get rid of the time dependence and we get sort of the standard way that the three body problem is viewed and, and the way that it, it gets analyzed. It's nice because then in that frame, M1 and M2 are always on the X axis. So we'll use little X and little Y to describe how the point P moves around. It's in this frame that the Lagrange points are found, halo orbits, and really all of the interesting stuff. So it's the main frame to be looking at. So we'll look at the rotating frame next time. So that's it. Thanks for hanging in there. If you appreciated this video, please like and subscribe, or just wait and watch the next video in the series. There are links and other materials in the description.